Hi everyone, welcome to today's luncheon webinar. Uh, folks are just joining, so I'm gonna give everyone another, give, give a couple of more minutes to see how many people um, join, and then we will get started with our presentations. Hi, this morning I was Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today we have two speakers. I will introduce them in just a moment, but I first wanted to let everyone know that the call for sessions is out and uh, you can submit until June 24th for the upcoming state conference that will take place in St. Louis, October 5th through 7th. So please go to the website and consider submitting a proposal. So moving on, our speakers today are two recent graduates from the St. Louis University Urban Planning and Development Program, and they're going to share their capstone projects. First, we're going to hear from Aidan Gillespie, and his project is entitled Engaging Future Planners, Designing an Urban Planning Course for High School Students. And then we'll hear from Bryce Monser, and her project is entitled We Need to Talk Toilets, Planning for Critical Infrastructure. So with that being said, I will turn the webinar over to Ada. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. I'll go ahead and uh, get my presentation shared here. All right, is that coming through? Yes. All right, thanks, Bryce. Uh, yeah, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Aiden Gillespie, and my capstone is uh, about creating a high school planning course. Um, and I chose this as my topic because my background is in education. And as I was wrapping up the degree at St. Louis U, I was trying to figure out how to weave uh, planning and education together. Um, I was a part time student at SLU, and during the day, I taught high school. Um, and in my experience, there are students at the high school level who are really interested in planning issues, um, but we don't really offer a specific uh, course in this, at least at my school. And um, it's been my experience just looking around in, in the St. Louis area that there's not too many um, other courses offered uh, in the planning realm. So my hope was to create a semester long urban planning course uh, that might fill that gap. And so today uh, I'll speak a little bit about the rationale for creating such a course, uh, look at a couple different examples of existing curricula that um, might provide some lessons and then lay out what I thought uh, a class could look like. And one of the things in our slew, um, in our classes, we kept returning to the AICP code of ethics. And one of the things that I was struck with is this idea that planners need to be continuously pursuing and faithfully serving the public interest, as well as increasing public understanding um, of planning activities. And I thought, well, what better way to increase public understanding of planning activities uh, than to teach uh, planning to some of our younger citizens? So in terms of the rationale and why should we do this, uh, in my background research, I had honed in on four key uh, justifications for planning education for younger people. So the first of these is civic engagement. Um, planning is really an outgrowth of our democratic process, which requires uh, civic engagement. Um, and that increased civic engagement, I think, can lead to, uh, the research shows it can lead to better health outcomes, more environmentally sustainable uh, decision-making uh, and, and more social cohesion um, among other benefits. 
And then the second rationale would be that planning education and learning about local history increases community uh, identification and place attachment. And that then leads back to better civic engagement. The third thing is that planning uh, education can give young people a voice. Uh, young people are individuals who cannot vote, but are nevertheless affected by planning decisions. Um, you know, some places have youth councils where they gather groups of, of young citizens to uh, consider how planning decisions will impact uh, younger generations. Um, and so by having this sort of curriculum uh, planning class, you could help children build the skills that are necessary to engage in the city planning process. Um, and we're expanding their voice, um, not to mention widening the field of view for planners uh, themselves. Giving people a voice builds their place attachment, which then builds civic engagement as well. And then I think the fourth uh, justification would be uh, that you, in the process, might be training future planners. Um, as we'll see in one of the case studies today, that is an explicit rationale of some planning curricula that are already out there. Um, planning impacts everybody's lives, but as we um, maybe remember from being a kid, you know, city planning doesn't typically register on like the top 10 list of uh, childhood dream jobs. And maybe by incorporating it into the curriculum, uh, we could, uh, could change that. And not to mention just have more uh, civically focused um, members of other professions. So with those four justifications in mind, I wanted to look at two efforts to create planning curricula that might provide lessons for somebody like myself, a high school teacher who's hoping to create an urban planning course. And the first of these is Box City. And some uh, of the people on this call might be familiar with it. It was created by the Center for Understanding the Built Environment uh, back in 1969 by a bunch of architects and, and designers, um, really to teach about urban design and, and the aesthetics of the built environment. Uh, the mission of this program has evolved somewhat uh, since then, but it is essentially an introduction to design principles, the basics of zoning, um, and then students come together in this six-week program to basically create their own city. Uh, they design blocks and put them all together and, and make a city. Um, it can be scaled up, but it's primarily for younger students. It's a really cool program and there's an example of one of the activities on the right hand side here it's a cognitive mapping activity where students visualize uh, their route to school they're introduced to planning terms like node and district um, and they actually draw a map of their uh, their commute um, between home and school and then think about what they see along the way and i think that's one of the strengths of the program it's it's not too heady in planning theory it's simple uh, it takes basic everyday tasks and tries to encourage students to critically examine those seemingly mundane activities. Um, it also promotes democratic values. It's collaborative. Students need to negotiate with each other in terms of creating the best uh, city. And it's adaptable. It can be woven into a bunch of different uh, subject areas at, at the younger levels. Um, it's also community reference. So Box City's developers recommend using students' neighborhoods uh, when they are creating their own um, their own new community. On the other hand, in thinking about how to put this together for a high school uh, course, some of the limitations of Box City are that it's, it's limited in terms of its prescriptions or its formal lesson plans. Um, it has a ton of handouts and activities, but uh, a, a new teacher maybe trying to implement this for the first time uh, would have to put in a significant amount of groundwork to, to try to figure out how things should be ordered. Um, it's also not grounded in specific education standards, which might make it more difficult uh, of a sell to a school administration, for example. Uh, and it's not really sufficient as a standalone class. It can be woven into other courses. It can be completed on its own, but for a full semester elective, it really wouldn't work out that way. The second program I looked at in my research was uh, Urban Plan, which um, we went through in the SLU program. Uh, it's put on by the Urban Land Institute, and it's really an emphasis on uh, economic development. So the participants in this simulation program, um, who are mostly upper level high school students, um, learn about urban economic development principles, and then they take on roles for a development company responding to uh, a request for proposals uh, for a financial, or I'm sorry, a, a fictional city. Um, and they develop, uh, put together a development plan. Uh, this is really geared towards these sort of juniors and seniors in high school that um, should be part of 
a required economics or government course, uh, typically upper level students. Um, I was able to speak with this person in the picture here, Harvey Love, the teacher on the left hand side, and he he's in the Ferguson Florissant district. He uses this as part of his business class. Um, so it can it can be adaptable uh, a little bit. Um, it's done over the course of three to four weeks, 15 to 18 hours. Uh, it can be done in a day for planning professionals, but this is something that typically requires sustained instruction over a few weeks for high school students. Um, it's a really cool program. Uh, here's the product. Students put together this Lego model. They have uh, a proposal delivered to planning professionals uh, with financial spreadsheets and written reports. Uh, it's really good in that it has explicit directions and lesson plans. It's got clear learning objectives and it's aligned with standards. So for somebody looking to implement this right away, they, they really could. Um, it's a little less adaptable though. It's not really good for the younger grades. Um, it's very much developer oriented and profit driven. Um, really your, your project works if it pencils out. Um, there's not really much in there about planning theory or why we do things the way we do. It's also not sufficient as a standalone class. Um, it can be done three to four weeks. Typically, it's used in the second half of a semester course, um, but it doesn't really work as, as its own class. So when I was thinking about um, what my course could look like, I had those two case studies in mind, and I considered what my course could look like. And I thought, well, um, it needs to have specific goals uh, that are grounded in educational standards so that you could gain buy-in from, um, from school administrators, from planning professionals you might want to incorporate into the classroom. Um, the goal here is to increase civic engagement and planning knowledge among young people. So what I did was, in terms of thinking of standards to use, I consulted the planning accreditation board's uh, list of curriculum requirements that um, they have for planning degree programs at the college level. Um, so I use those as, as my base. And you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here, sort of the, the general planning knowledge section of that uh, curriculum framework. A high school planning course would have to have engaging activities too. One of the lessons I learned from Box City and Urban Plan is that those hands-on activities uh, where students are engaged in multiple modes of learning and instruction um, are really key to getting buy-in from those students. Um, it should also be specific while also being adaptable. So I needed to create a course that somebody could implement, implement on day one without necessarily feeling constrained um, such that they couldn't adapt it to their own set of students. And that's the other piece of this. It needed to be community referenced. Um, the course needed to be uh, something that people could use in their particular classroom, with their particular students. So I've woven the planning accreditation board standards. I used understanding by design, which is the backwards design model. It's kind of the preferred approach uh, among educators for planning a course. Um, I use things uh, that we discuss in our planning theory class about uh, like the rational planning model, the pluralist planning model, uh, different processes uh, for how to achieve the outcomes that we're hoping for um, when I was creating uh, the course itself. And I also, this was coming out of St. Louis U, I used the Ignatian pedagogical paradigm where you consider people's context, um, you take action, you evaluate that action, um, and then uh, you move, move forward from there. So this is uh, what ended up coming out of uh, my own planning course creation. Um, I created a course with five units and they're shown here. They start, it starts off with the purpose and meaning of planning. Um, and the essential question for this unit is on the right hand side and students are asking what is a community. Um, then they move on into the second unit where they discuss planning theory and the history of planning. Um, and so they ask how have people organized their settlements in different spaces and time. We move into planning law in the third unit. Um, students are uh, they're challenged to consider the right balance between individual and collective power in a modern community. Unit four, they discuss contemporary planning issues, like how can we expand opportunities for all, all people? Um, and then in the fifth unit, they think about the future. So they try to figure out how they can balance the ideal city, the ideal environment that they have thought about throughout units one, two, three, and four with what's possible. 
And I use those PAB standards, um, the planning accreditation board standards throughout. And so you can kind of see here how I've tried to weave those in. So early on, they're talking about the purpose of planning, why we do it. They move into theory, law, uh, then they talk about contemporary issues. And then at the end, um, it's really the, the skills sort of putting it all together. So this is an example of a unit plan that adheres to that understanding by design model and any uh, unit plan that uses this model is going to have three stages. The first stage is the desired results. So you have your goals on the left and I tried to include not only the planning accreditation board standards, but also some national common core and then Missouri state standards um, to try to make it easy to see how the, the course would fit in with what schools sometimes are constrained by in terms of what sorts of standards they, they need to uh, need to hit. Um, in this first unit, students are asking what a community is, why my places need to be planned. Those are the essential questions. Uh, hopefully by the end of it, they understand that places look different as a result of planning or the lack of planning, that groups of people engage in planning for a lot of different reasons. Planners take the long view of their communities uh, and that planning is a collaborative activity. They'll know the motivations for urban planning. They'll know the organizations responsible for it. Some key terms like amenity or transit or zones. Um, and they'll be skilled at conducting walk audits and SWOT analyses. Oh, I forgot I had this animated here. Um, in stage two, uh, they we talk about uh, in the teacher world, it's like, well, how are you gonna measure this? Um, and so the assessments for this unit are, uh, they conduct a walk audit of their own neighborhood. Um, and I thought as, as kind of an introduction, this first unit, they do a book review um, where they read and review a children's book, uh, thinking of uh, The Little House or Make Way for Ducklings or Richard Scary, um, and use some of the terms that they've learned to analyze that book's presentation of the ideal city. And of course, there's also quizzes and weekly reading reflections um, along the way. And then for each of my five units, uh, I have what I consider sort of the meat of things, uh, this stage three, the learning plan. Um, and this is a suggested framework of how you could get to the goals that you, you wanna see the students uh, achieve by the end of the unit. So here I have a three to four week plan of, of suggested activities. You could start off with a hook, um, use that cognitive mapping activity from Box City, ask students how they get to school um and have them map it out that might lead into a socratic discussion of the essential questions for the unit um there are readings and lectures uh throughout where teachers are able to model uh what they want students to be able to do later on so you model the walk audit you introduce students to how cities have been presented in pop culture uh before they then uh, do their book review um, and then the unit concludes with the performance tasks and students um, sharing those with their peers. So I have this for all five units. This is an example of what it would look like for the first one. So uh, hopefully here, I've just kind of laid out an introduction to uh, the urban planning course I've created for high school students that I hope one day to be able to use, um, or I hope somebody else is able to use it as well. Uh, I think moving forward, uh, anybody who would want to implement this would need to um, develop specific lesson plans uh, for a course like this. So I've created the unit plans, um, but the day day to day course prep uh, is still on the teacher at this point, and um, that would need to be done ahead of time. I think also in order to see whether this would be effective or not, it would need to be implemented, and I hope I get to do that. But um, you would want to implement the course and reflect upon its success, measure whether or not it increases planning knowledge uh, among high school students. But I hope that what I've created is standards based, it's community referenced. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on St. Louis in the second and third units, for example, and students in other communities might reference other, uh, other cities, for example. Um, but this is really my dream to get younger students, the younger generation interested and excited in, uh, about planning. Uh, and its impact on their lives. So hopefully I've provided a little bit of a roadmap for how to get there. Um, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. All right.
Thank you, Aiden. That was great. Um, let's move on to Bryce. Go ahead, Bryce. Hi, everyone. My name is Bryce Monzer. Uh, I took a little bit of a different approach during my capstone presentation, and mine took more of a form of a research project about um, how I'm going to share my screen. Uh, uh oh. Hey, Jess, I don't appear to have the ability to share my screen. Try now. Now I do. Thank you. So we can talk about toilets and how we can plan for them as critical infrastructure. <clears throat> so I'm going to preface this by saying I'm going to be using a lot of familiar language throughout this presentation because I am I have the opinion that using euphemisms has generally gotten us into more uh, trouble than it's solved. So I'm first going to address the question, where do you go when there's no place to go? Then uh, look into who toilet access impacts. Then we're going to discuss uh, what is critical infrastructure and why toilets should be considered as such. <clears throat> then I'm going to share with you some of the methodology I used for reviewing my case studies uh, and including a couple of implementation examples. And then finally, I'm going to cover the best practices and some of my own planning recommendations that I've been pondering. So herein lies the problem I'm hoping to address. There are not enough clean, safe, accessible public toilets currently in the United States. The issues that I'll be outlining in this presentation became glaring issues to me at the beginning of the pandemic. I was working seven hour days delivering uh, groceries all over the St. Louis region. And I had started to notice that all of the publicly accessible restrooms that had previously been open including in gas stations were now closed. And so I made some choices. I either held it or I went pee behind some building. But questions that came to me was what if I didn't just have to go pee? What if I was inadvertently subjecting myself to some sort of violence in those vulnerable moments? And what if I got caught by some law enforcement officer that wanted to charge me with indecent exposure? And all of those questions, just because I was trying to do a job and simultaneously trying to live my life. Uh, with a limited access to public toilets, we can face shame and degradation, which are horribly impactful factors on how we carry ourselves in our lives. Without adequate access and availability to the shelter that we require to participate fully in our society, we're not living the life that our national guiding documents have promised us. So these pictures were taken from a couple months ago at the beginning of spring um, happening in St. Louis. People's shelters uh, were actively being seized and destroyed by city officials who were and continue to conduct sweeps of tent encampments for unhoused folks. And the same thing is happening all over the country. Unhoused SEL is uh, doing really important work and awareness raising in the community. And I strongly urge you all to follow them on social media. <clears throat> I bring this up because when we're talking about equitable urban planning in whatever realm, it's important to keep in mind how social discrimination and government sanctioned disinvestment like this continues to shape our urban landscape. Uh, and even though planning for free and affordable housing is potentially more complicated than planning for public restrooms, there is a lot of crossover among who these insufficient support services impact the hardest. And it's important that we continue to pay attention to those groups. Part of addressing those basic support services needed for those without reliable housing is to address the overall societal need for suitable toilet access. Every single one of us has needed to use a toilet when we're out in the world. And even if right now you enjoy the luxury of a steel bladder or a well-behaved colon, that might not be true forever. 
the scarcity of public toilets impact seniors, pregnant women, little children, menstruating people, folks on blood pressure medication, and those who are experiencing symptoms of irritable bowel disease. Um, the people in these circumstances are referred to as restroom challenged. And even if this isn't you right now, you probably care about someone who falls into that category. These groups can also experience higher rates of isolation um, due to a perceived risk of inadequate access to a toilet when they leave their homes. And it can lead those restroom challenged groups to avoid leaving their homes altogether. So a little background info on this topic. Uh, public toilets as a component of modern urban planning has really only been around for about 150 years. They were originally born out of a necessity to address widespread diseases. However, implementation of toilets in the urban landscape throughout those years has been fraught with discrimination around class, gender expression, race, and physical ability. And through the shifts in societal attitudes around public restrooms and overall economic disinvestment in public toilet infrastructure, uh, we are, in particularly in the United States, left with an extreme uh, deficit in public restroom facilities. The facilities that are open to use by anyone, no matter uh, race, gender, economic standing, physical ability, are referred to as public restrooms, which is an important distinction from publicly accessible uh, toilets, which have some sort of gatekeeping measure and are typically located inside of uh, retail, businesses, institutional facilities that require the user to appear in a socially accepted and trusted way. So those of us who meet those accepted standards uh, are referred to as potty privileged, but keep in mind that not everybody in our community meets those potty privileged qualifications and can often be turned away in a time of need. So like Aiden, I am attempting in this exploration to honor our ethical commitment as planners to improve uh, public planning knowledge and increase public understanding of planning activities. So with that, I wanna address this question. What is critical infrastructure? Well, things that are, are considered infrastructure are generally taken more seriously and treated with respect in our bureaucratic world of planning and development. And uh, it boils down to the facilities, systems, and assets that are essential for the functioning of society and the economy. That word essentially indicates that the destruction of those assets would have a debilitating impact on society and the economy. I will add that our economy would not exist without a society to uphold it. Uh, however, supporting a functional economy is considered essential because it's become a necessity in order to uphold a standard quality of life within our society. Those standards include things like safe connected roads, clean drinking water, functioning sewage systems, use of electricity and the internet, and access to healthcare and safety. So how are public toilets uh, considered critical infrastructure? Well, by supporting the biological needs and comfort of individuals that make up our society, we would in an ideal world create a positive feedback loop that strengthens a more equitable economy. Research has shown that healthy people generate a healthier economy. And if a healthier economy can cultivate flourishing public spaces, this may then generate a healthier society and the cycle would continue. So as a planner of urban spaces, uh, the heart of my argument is this, including public toilet facilities as a part of critical infrastructure provides an invitation to society to participate in urban life. Having ready access to clean, safe public restrooms is not only a vital part of personal and public health, but it's also the key to fostering livability in cities. So I'm switching gears a little bit and I'm gonna walk uh, us through the evaluation, the evaluation criteria that I use throughout my research and case studies on this subject. 
So I first was looking into the mission uh, of these of these cases. What was the problem that was being addressed by the organization or the entity? Uh, and then looking at the uh, locations where their efforts were implemented and where they were successful. Uh, observing who the stakeholders were, who was driving and supporting the mission. And additionally, what if any legal directive uh, was taken through, through the use of policy and planning measures? And then lastly, how was the intended mission successfully executed through implementation? All of the organizations and case studies that I explored focus the brunt of their work on some combination of these three categories. So facility infrastructure, which is implementing physical toilet facilities into an urban landscape, policy directives and the use of guiding documents, and advocacy and activism in order to raise public awareness uh, of the need for more public toilets. So we'll start off by looking at how those physical toilet facilities have been implemented. Most cities that are able to get through all of those foundational steps to successfully implement infrastructure employ a mix of toilet options. Those can be traditional brick and mortar built-in facilities, supervised facilities, automated public toilets, urinals, or portable toilets. Two of the leading organizations in the US uh, on this front are the Portland Loo and the San Francisco Pit Stop Program. <clears throat> most of the research about public toilets and the communities that use them suggests that the two most important elements for the public's use of these toilet facilities are cleanliness and the actual or perceived level of safety within and around the public toilet unit. The success of this group, the Portland Loo, likely comes from the design elements that focus heavily on features to prevent nefarious activities like drug use or sex acts or vandalism, paired with a commitment of the purchasing municipality to clean and maintain the units. These particular units are non-automated and as I mentioned, they're purchased and maintained by city officials from this private company, Madden Fabrication. They cost about $150,000, which does not include annual maintenance. Alternatively, the San Francisco Pit Stop Program utilizes the city's public resources and works with nonprofit partners to set up and maintain around 33 toilet facilities uh, for use around the city. They employ a mix of automated public toilets, which were designed by a French kiosk and street furniture company that makes up 25 of those locations. And the other units across the city are attended mobile facilities that utilize, that are utilized in spaces that have um, a higher need or, and or uh, high pedestrian activity. The site determination for those mobile units is directly related to the number of reports of human feces on the sidewalk, which is a map that actually exists and is accessible on the internet. So in Seattle, there's this hygiene center called Urban Rest Stop, uh, which offers toilets, showers, laundry services, and other hygiene resources uh, in two locations. It's targeted and was created to support unhoused communities and has been crucial in helping folks maintain employment. Unfortunately, it's been difficult to maintain funding for these facilities and they're quite often overburdened, which indicates to me the severity of the need to include more types of these uh, facilities and support services. Locally in Missouri, this is sort of the spectrum that we're working with. We have our city owned or park entity owned and operated brick and mortar facilities like you can see on the left, or we have porta potties that are typically rented by private businesses or individuals for whatever reason for events and such. Um, in this case, sort of randomly on the corner of, of Boyle and Laclede in the central west end. <clears throat> 
So in order to address this availability gap, we're gonna look into some of the policy directives and how the use of guiding documents around public toilet planning can work themselves into this process. In order to get toilet facilities implemented into the urban landscape, these policy and planning directives must first exist to allow the facilities to be built. Including a public toilet component into a great streets initiative or a complete streets program that includes actionable planning directives can help catalyze facility implementation. Access to toilets is a critical piece of what allows cities to cultivate multimodality, which is a large uh, component of what those complete and great streets plans are hoping to accomplish in the first place. The distinct lack of references to public toilets and planning documents, particularly here in Missouri, um, or resources on, on the subject is a detriment to getting this type of work accomplished. One city that has successfully implemented public toilet plan and facilities was in Toronto, Ontario. They called their program Vibrant Streets, a coordinated street furniture program. In it, it lays out the design and policy guidelines for their street furniture improvements across the city. This program was formed after the city submitted an RFP for, business, for a business partner to help fund the improvements which they found in 2007 with an advertising and street furniture company uh, called Astral Media. Uh, with the agreement and the understanding that Astral would fund and maintain 20 automated public toilets over the course of 20 years throughout the Toronto area. This was a public private partnership that ensured that no cost would be borne by the city in exchange for the advertising space that the facilities provided. Unfortunately, as of 2018, only three of those 20 have actually been built. One of the biggest challenges there being limitations for site determination because of the, the sheer size of the units combined with a general not in my backyard attitude from residents throughout that um, the planning process. So finally, I'm going to touch on some of the advocacy work that some organizations are engaged in in order to raise public awareness about these public toilet shortcomings. A lot of this proactive work comes from organizations whose mission is to support folks with irritable bowel disease like Crohn's and colitis. Their grand mission is the same as mine to increase the actual number of facilities available to the public but their advocacy work operates on a much smaller initial scale in order to uh, increase the availability to facilities for people with health conditions that prompt urgent bathroom needs. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundations of the US and in Canada are two of these organizations. Both have produced uh, mobile toilet finder applications and actively endorse policies that encourage private businesses to have open door policy for the use of their toilets. Additional support, research, and resources for increasing public toilet availability across North America, regardless of medical condition, come from the American Restroom Association and the Gotta Go campaign from a group out of Ottawa. Another advocacy avenue to be aware of is the Restroom Access Act, which is also called Ali's Law. Uh, back in 2004, a young woman named Ali who suffers from IBD formulated a bill that when enacted would require all retail establishments to allow anyone with a medical condition in need of urgent use of a toilet to use that facility's restroom. Since then, since 2004, only 16 states have enacted this law. Uh, Missouri has not passed this law. And my thought is that considering how much power private businesses hold with regard to the use of their public toilet facilities, passing this law could be an important first measure for transitioning all retail establishments to allow anybody to use their toilet facilities when there's no public option available. So those Crohn's and Colitis Foundations I mentioned earlier also promote wayfinding signage in businesses and throughout the public realm. 
the Go Here Washroom Access Initiative implemented a, a fairly simple agreement with businesses for them to display a window decal, which is pictured here, which indicates the availability of their toilet for public use. In this case, the businesses agree voluntarily, but I'm thinking that this could be an avenue um, to suggest there are opportunities to maybe incentivize or subsidize businesses to participate in a similar open door policy agreement. And in the public sector, we just need better urban signage overall, <clears throat> especially uh, for visitors and tourists who may be unfamiliar with the area, which can keep people returning and um, act as an asset for supporting local tourism economy. So additionally, those groups uh, are these mobile toilet applications, one of which is called the We Can't Wait mobile app, which launched in February of this year. It uses crowdsourced and business source information to mark restroom locations all over uh, whatever city you're in all across the United States. So my thought here is that if we can get people to start using these types of tools, we'll be influencing accessibility, availability, comfort, and peace of mind, while also increasing public awareness of the local toilet landscape of whatever space they're in. A next step for the use of these toilet maps might be an integration with transit-oriented applications to inform folks of alternatives to relieving themselves in train stations. The overall hope here is that better educated and informed people make better decisions. It's important to offer those sort of soft solutions to these everyday concerns about toilet access. Whether you're gathering petition signatures for the public from the public for policy improvement or bringing a policy recommendation to a council, down the line when toilet related policy and development is up for public review, these small steps will form the foundation to change those potential NIMBY opinions to, yim to YIMBY opinions. <clears throat> so I'm gonna leave you all with some final thoughts and recommendations. As planners and folks who are invested in improving the shared resources of our cities, we are positioned to influence the guiding documents from which our cities are planned for and developed. This being said, here in St. Louis, we need to develop a public toilet strategy. This can be achieved by conducting an assessment of the current state of public toilet infrastructure in this town through exploring research that identifies the needs and shortcomings of that infrastructure, as well as identifying opportunities that lie at the intersections of social, business, and government responsibilities on the subject. The central component for creating a public toilet strategy is rooted in supporting the formation of both short-term and long-term public toilet objectives. A short-term objective could look like fostering more awareness through providing public toilet information to the public uh, in the form of increasing signage, popularizing the use of those toilet map apps, or campaigning to pass uh, a restroom access act here in Missouri. All that can lay the foundation for a more long-term objective, which can take the form of establishing site-specific standards for facility implementation that focuses on location needs, safety, and cleanliness. All of that is leading to this big end goal of increasing availability and accessibility to public toilets in our urban spaces for anyone to use, no matter their potty privilege. So with that, thank you for listening and thank you preemptively for helping me continue this conversation. And this is a book that I recommend that everyone read. So I'm just gonna leave that up for a second. <laughs> All right, thank you, Bryce. That was so interesting. Um, I wanna open it up to questions now on either presentation. Uh, so if any of our attendees would like to um, go ahead and ask a question. You can put it in the Q&A. Oh, I saw one pop up. Amy asked, Aiden, do you have the opportunity to make this class a reality? 
Um, yeah, that's that's my goal. Um, I proposed it as an elective actually for this coming school year at the, the school I work at. And um, we unfortunately did not have enough student interest. We, there were some students who signed up for it, but not enough to actually justify uh, the section. But I'm hoping that now that I, I didn't have the curriculum solidified at that point. So now that I have that under my belt, ho hopefully you know, I'd be able to market it a little bit better for next year. Great, thank you, Aiden. Other questions? <laughs> nice use of emojis, Bryce, in the chat. <laughs> Any other questions? So I'll add a comment. I'll say, Bryce, I think your um, your topic so interesting because you know, as we all learn, the planning movement kind of came out of the sanitation movement, and uh, it's not something that we really talk about that much in planning anymore. So I like that you're kind of bringing it full circle and bringing this topic back to. Um, you know, how it interfaces with planning and kind of our current reality and situation. So appreciate that. Yeah, it's a conversation that I hope to get, I will truly have with anybody that wants to engage about it um, genuinely. Um, and it's gotten, <laughs> it's easy to get a reputation. So I just get people sending me articles about public restrooms and it's fantastic. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Any other questions for either speaker? Let's see. Oh, two, two more. Jonathan asks, Bryce, did you come across communities considering public toilets in their streetscape project? Uh, E.g., considering it a similar item like benches, trees, etc. Not in this community. I mean, not in in Missouri. Um, yeah, no, it's um, it's largely and consistently left out of conversations in this part of the country. And I don't know if that has to do with the concentration or um, or just the lack of comfort on the topic. But um, yeah, I mean, they are they're mostly coming out of places in in Canada and, and there's a lot of conversation going on in New York because that's, you know, always hot topic and then on the West Coast. Yeah, I read an article maybe a year or two ago about uh, these kind of public urinals that were being installed in Paris as kind of like street furniture and had this like really weird design. Um, and, you know, basically like, well, we have to do something about this because it's, you know, it's a real issue. They have ones that look like mailboxes. I, I had a whole slide about urinals on there, but I took it out because from like, I don't know, a body equity standpoint, they are a little, they're discriminatory. I can't. Yeah, that's a it. great point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, that is a great point. And then Sarah asks, Bryce, I noticed that Illinois has a restroom access law. Is there a way to start implementation on the east side of the river? Yeah, I'm doing it, Dr. Coffin. This is it. This is where it starts. Want to help me write something? <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, well, if not, then I think we can end today's luncheon. Um, thanks to the attendees and Bryce and Aiden, congrats on your graduation and thanks for coming and presenting to us today. Very interesting work. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us, this is fun. <laughs> All right, thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye folks. Bye.